Why? Why did you put that in your narrowband filter? I don't get it. Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to have a look at all of those multi-band narrowband filters for color cameras that basically let you do narrowband imaging on emission nebulae without needing a monochrome camera. You just have a color camera with a multi-band narrowband filter like the OPT Trad Ultra, the Optolong L Extreme, uh, or all, this, all sorts of filters that are available on the market. And today we're just going to compare the specs to see what I think based on the specifications only or the best filters for uh, people in light polluted areas like me here in Tokyo. Uh, before that, if you're new to the channel, by the way, welcome. Uh, this channel is all about astrophotography and all the tips and tricks uh, related to that. If that's something that sounds interesting, feel free at any time to go down below and click that subscribe button. And one of the really good things about those filters is that they typically publish specifications of like the uh, the spectrums that and the bands that they have which means that it's very easy to actually compare those filters without even owning them i've personally owned um three of the filters that i'm going to talk about today i've owned uh, a japanese filter called the citron japan quad bp filter i've owned the uh, opt tried ultra and i currently have the optolong l extreme uh, and we'll be we'll be looking at other narrowband filters looking at the specs at their specs and assuming that the filter is up to the actual specs that it has because i've had uh, some of my narrowband filters uh, measured via a spectrometer a while back and uh, yeah it was not quite up to spec but assuming it's up to spec let's see what we can uh, get from those filters and what better way to do that than with slides <laughs> let's get into it so the, uh, the the first filter that I want to look at is actually fairly new. It's from IDAS. Uh, I think it's like Hutech, Astronomy or whatever. That's the reseller in the United States. Uh, those filters are made in Japan. And IDAS, recently they made like the NB1, uh, short for narrowband 1, NB2, short for narrowband 2. Um, and those filters, they're still being sold. But if you look at the Japanese website, they're no longer being made. So whatever is being sold right now is just the available stock. Uh, to replace those filters, uh, we have the NBZ filter and uh, uh, yeah, a Nebuya booster, as we can see here. So here we have the spectrum. And this is a very interesting filter. Uh, I didn't know it existed until I did my research today. And we can see it's very targeted at oxygen 3 and at H alpha with a relatively narrow band pass of 12 nanometer. When you're doing narrow band imaging, even if you're not in a super light polluted area, the narrower the band pass, the better. Because the band pass that comes from your emission nebula is really super precisely from one spot, or in the case of O3, from two spots. And it, the tighter you can get around those spots, the better. Um, and 12 nanometer, although there are exceptions with N2, but whatever. But 12 nanometer band pass is a decent uh, band pass, uh, but it's not great either. What makes this filter interesting to me is uh, this slide here. And it's the reason why I'm starting with this filter here. It's uh, the way that it reacts to uh, focal ratios. Because one of the things with narrowband filters, the um, angle of the light rays that go into your optical system, they will uh, shift the band pass of your filter. So that the same filter will not have the same uh, band pass or the same transmission for a given uh, band pass uh, at a certain focal ratio compared to another focal ratio. And typically, the uh, lower the focal ratio, meaning the higher the angle of attack of the uh, light rays, the more band pass we, ha we have and therefore the less effective the filter, filter becomes. And IDAS provides this really neat graph where we can compare, like the gray line here is an F4 cone F1.4, sorry, F1.4 cone. And the purple uh, line here is a Raza 8 cone, which I think is F2.0, uh, which tells us that this filter will work great, at least in oxygen 3, um, even with super fast systems like Raza. Now, even filters that have more band pass or band shift, uh, like the Optolong L Extreme, are um, the uh, the uh, OPD Trad Ultra that have very tight band passes and so are more affected by uh, shift in the uh, in the band 
will still give you great images, but you'll be shifting so much that instead of transmitting like 90% of H alpha or oxygen three, you're transmitting 50%. So you're losing on the amount of light that you're getting, even though you're gonna get, get great result, it's not as good as you could have gotten otherwise. Quick from the future here, I want to add a little precision about this bandpass shift. The bandpass shift depends on the angle of the light rays as they hit the filter itself. And we can see we're using this diagram here. This here is on the left is your lens, is your objective lens. So it could be like the mirror, whatever. Uh, but what we can see is that the light rays that come from very distant objects, they're basically parallel. So we have tons of parallel light rays that hit our objective lens. And then they are basically uh, uh, angled towards the focal plane where your sensor resides. This is a very simplified view, but that's basically how it is. Your filter is in front of all of that. It covers all of the light rays, but you can see that a light ray that hit the center of the objective lens will not be at any angle compared to the filter. Whereas it's, it, I mean, it will be at a 90, ang a 90 degree angle compared to the filter. But a, a light ray that hit the outside of the objective lens will have a very different um, angle, so quite offset from 90 degrees while it passes through the filter, which means that this transmission loss of the signal due to the bandpass shift is um, has more effect for the light rays that hit the outside of your lens. And the, the, the closer you're to the center, the less bandpass shift there is. Uh, so what you're doing is effectively you're reducing the aperture of your telescope by uh, by using a very like let's say narrow band filter with um, uh, a very fast telescope so you're neutralizing a lot of the advantage of why you have a fast telescope in the first place and one thing to keep in mind as well is that when i'm saying you're masking you're basically masking your objective lens or you're diminishing the aperture of your objective lens this is for the useful signal only any light pollution that is around that uh, wavelength is just going to come through as usual it, because light pollution is not like single line emissions like nebulae are. So you're, uh, you're, you have full um, aperture for light pollution, but you have a shifted and a, a, a smaller aperture and then a worse F ratio for your useful signal. So you have a double whammy there. Uh, you're still gonna get excellent pictures, but there is indeed a drawback. Okay, back to normal quiv. Um, so it's always something to keep in mind. Uh, those filters will often market themselves as being fine up to like F2, which is absolutely true, but you're still losing some transmission because of that bandpass shift. And this is a great illustration of that. If we look at H alpha, it's more sensitive to that. If we look at the purple line in this case, which is the Raza 8 at uh, F2, maybe F1.8 actually, because it's more severe than blue here, that's F2. But anyway, we see that for H alpha, it's a bit less good. We're getting down from 95% uh, peak transmission uh, to uh, something like 85%, but still it's not a huge loss. And I love IDAS for publishing this. I think this would be a great filter for uh, fast imaging, like for your Samyang um, F1.8, I don't remember 135 millimeter lens or for your Raza 8 uh, or all these kind of systems that would be a great filter and it's relatively cheap at $300 because yes it sounds a lot for a piece of glass uh, but if you look at like uh, Astrodon narrowband filters uh, you'll be convinced that this is not so much money uh, <laughs> and and then you have a single filter that can do all of the work of multiple narrowband filters with a single camera uh, single color camera, sorry, single filter. It works really well. Okay, so IDAS, $300, looks pretty good. Let's look at what we have next. Next is a filter that I've used in the past. It's uh, unique to Japan, as far as I know. It's called the Citron Japan Quad BP filter. Uh, BP standing for band pass. And it it's called Quad because it will pass oxygen 3, H beta, H alpha, and sulfur 2. Now, Let's take this opportunity to talk about those band passes. H alpha is in most emission nebula, the, the strongest signal that you get by far. So it's the most critical part. It's deep in the red spectrum. Sulfur two is also deep in the red, in the red spectrum. It's typically kind of a reflection of H alpha. 
And it's a much weaker signal that provides much less signal to noise ratio. Which means that if you're, if you're capturing with an, uh, an OSC, one-shot color sensor, both H-alpha and S2 will be uh, mixed in the red. So we won't be able to separate them anymore. Which means that sulfur 2 is basically drowning in H-alpha. It's almost irrelevant. Um, and so as far as I can tell, we don't need sulfur 2 in this kind of filter. That is my feeling. And I am not like... I think they call it the quad BP simply because it does have all of those multiple bands. Whether those bands are actually useful, that's another story. From my knowledge, my opinion, and please correct me down in the comments if I'm wrong, because S2 is so weak in like pretty much 95% of the targets that you're going to image compared to H-alpha, it's just not useful to have it in there. And what we have with those large band passes is it means that we will let in more light pollution in the red spectrum. But what's worse, worse is in oxygen three. Oxygen three is great. Oxygen three, if we go back to the IDAS chart, you can see we have actually two lines. And that's because we indeed have two lines of emission. The main one is uh, at 500.7 nanometer. Uh, the uh, shorter one, that's roughly one third of the main one, is at uh, 495 something um, band pass. Or, yeah, something like that. Uh, and so here we can see we have the two bands for oxygen 3 that are covered, and we also have H beta. What is H beta? H beta is still a transmission from hydrogen. Uh, atoms basically, but they need they they require a, a higher level of energy to be excited into emitting light. I'm simplifying, um, but this means that H beta is basically a clone of H alpha, but much less powerful. So what you're getting with H beta here, and it's like the strength of it, on like I think like at most, from what I read, would be one third of H alpha. Most of the time, it's more like one eighth or one tenth, meaning that what this does when you have H beta in there, it just means that you're getting a clone, a pure clone of H alpha that's just weaker and you're registering it in your camera within your green and blue pixels. Uh, there's a better way to do that. It would be to not capture H beta. And if you really, really, really want to put your uh, H beta into the blue green kind of uh, uh, spectrum, you separate your channel in processing, take H alpha and add it a little bit to oxygen three or to the blue channel. So you take the red channel, you add a bit of it to the blue channel and then you, you play around. So that's one of the things that I don't understand about why people are, are, are those makers insist on putting H beta in here because the blue side of the channel, which is where uh, H beta and oxygen three is in my experience, the most sensitive to light pollution and to moon light pollution as well. So you want really to get the channel as tight as possible. So you do not let in a uh, signal that you don't need and our light pollution that you don't need. So here we could just cut away H beta and be fine. But we'll see there's something frustrating with one of the uh, follow-up filters that we are going to look at. Uh, so again, correct me if I'm wrong, but to me, H beta in uh, narrowband imaging doesn't make a huge lot of sense. Um, it makes sense for visual because even if H beta is like one tenth of the strength of H alpha, when you have a visual H beta filter, it's in the blue, almost green uh, uh, light band, meaning it's your eye is super sensitive to it, whereas it's much less sensitive to the deep red of H alpha. So you can really separate nebula when you're doing visual using H beta because your eye is so sensitive to it. And even at one tenth of the strength of H alpha, or one third of the strength of H alpha, it's still a very strong signal. So good for visual, I'm not convinced for imaging. The quad BP filter is roughly $182. So it's not super expensive, but there's better value. Let's go next. Next one is the ZW dual band filter. Uh, I couldn't see like really good specs of that. Uh, when I look at it like that, it seems to have in the Oxygen 3 roughly the same band pass as the Quad BP and a slightly ten a tighter band pass uh, in H alpha. So uh, not great, not terrible, uh, like 3.6 run GANs would be. Uh, $149. 
that's cheap. So yeah, if you're tight for, for cash, that could be a good thing. And you can see that the, the max transmission is roughly 90%. Uh, compared to 95% for the Quad BP and 95% for the IDAS. Okay, so decent filter. Next, we go to the Rolls Royce, the expensive filter. This is the Radiant Triad Ultra quad band filter and quad band because it accepts four bands. Uh, let's look. I, I owned this filter. I had the, the two inch version. I paid, paid the full price. I sold it in the end. Um, it's expensive. It's $1,075. That's a lot of money. Why is it so expensive? It's because it has very tight band passes. We talked about 12 nanometers for the uh, IDAS filter. Here we're looking at oxygen three, four nanometers. Awesome. That is freaking awesome. And 98.7%, uh, yeah, 97% transmission. This is so cool. good. Hydrogen alpha. 4 nanometers, 87% transmission. This is amazing. This is great. And then I go into the why? Why did you put that in your narrowband filter? I don't get it. And maybe like someone can make me get it in the comment because I don't understand why we have that. We have sulfur 2. It's 4 nanometers, so it's not the end of the world. It's very tight. So it doesn't let in a lot of light pollution. It lets in a bit of signal, so we're not losing so much in signal to noise ratio, but it feels to me it's just getting drowned into a hydrogen alpha and we just give like free entry to uh, light pollution in that uh, part of the spectrum for little to no benefit. And then we have a hydrogen beta and that's worse. I mean, again, feel free to correct me in the comments. I might be completely wrong, but it's like it's a clone of hydrogen alpha. And we have a, a five nanometer uh, band pass. And to me, that's just like a free entry gateway for light pollution in the blue spectrum. It's like, I don't know why we have this. I, I, I feel like this filter, you remove hydrogen beta, you remove sulfur two, because the hydrogen beta will get mixed with oxy oxygen three. You will not be able to separate them. Uh, hydrogen alpha will get mixed with sulfur two. Hydrogen alpha is the strongest in the bunch. Oxygen three is also, it's not super strong, but has its own kind of specific, specific, specificities. It's very different from hydrogen alpha in terms of the structures that it reveals. So hydrogen alpha, so hydrogen alpha and oxygen three, awesome. Tight band pass, awesome. And then you have to ruin that, as far as I can tell, again, please correct me in the comments, with this free gateway for light pollution. This could be great for, let's say, Bordel 5-6 zones. But it feels like I wish they did a dual band filter with 4 nanometer, 4 nanometer for like 500 bucks. I would totally buy that. That would be amazing. So yeah, for $1,000, I already bought it. I sold it. I unfortunately would not buy again. Although it could be a consideration if you're in a slightly lower Bordel zone than I am and have less light pollution. The tri-band. Um, tri-band is, is also quite amazing. Like the H-alpha, if you look at this, this is three nanometer. That is amazing. Uh, the only problem with that is that it will block uh, N2, um, which is another band pass from emission nebulae, uh, not from emission nebulae, for, uh, sorry, for, from planetary nebulae that we see a lot of time. The four nanometer probably lets it through. The three nanometer probably doesn't. So there is a drawback around H-alpha to too tight a band pass, but it's not the end of the world. And for emission nebulae, you don't really care. This is amazing. And then we go to the band pass of oxygen three and H-beta, which is 18 nanometer. And this is actually not bad at all. Like, I mean, again, we don't need H-beta, but you know, remember 18 nanometer, versus the IDAS 12 nanometer in uh, oxygen three. Like, I don't really care whether it has H beta or not. It's not that much of an entry gateway for light pollution. I mean, it's not as good still as this one where we have a total of nine nanometers in the blue. Um, but what is like the issue that I, was, that I seen here is the price again, 775 US dollars. And the reason I say that is because we have uh, better options with uh, things like the L-Enhance filter. 
and also the L Extreme filter. So the L Enhance filter, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the band passes are, but we see it's something like, it's basically like this, but less good. <laughs> so it's pretty much the same as the tri-band, but really like the tri-band is better. Uh, but the Opsilong is much cheaper at 230 US dollars, basically. It has less of a tight band pass um, around H-alpha. Uh, probably something similar, a bit, yeah, a bit less tight also around H-beta and Oxygen 3. I think it's a good compromise if you're in like a bottle 5.6 uh, uh, area. But really what we go to my favorite filter and the one that I currently own, um, it, which is the uh, Optolong L Extreme. The Optolong L Extreme, it focuses on just H alpha, no sulfur two, and on just oxygen three, no H beta. Yes, this is exactly you know what I want, and I would love like OPT Radian to be uh, to be doing the same thing, but with uh, like three nanometer or four nanometer. I would pay like five hundred, six hundred dollars for that. The Optolong L Extreme itself is $310. So it's more expensive than a lot of the other filters, but then it's it's still in the same price range as the others with the exception of the Radian. It's like the same order of magnitude. And um, it isolates exactly the bands that you want and the band passes only seven nanometers, uh, which is not great, but it's good. It's a strong, good band pass. On the H alpha side, it will also let in um, N2, which is good for planetary uh, nebula. On the oxygen three side, it will let in a bit of light pollution, which is too bad, but that's the way it is. And to be honest, if you have the, the, the cash for the L extreme and the L enhance, even if you're like in a bottle four and you want to do narrow band imaging, just get the L extreme. You'll still reject more light pollution, you will get better signal to noise ratio in the end for a given amount of time spent on the target. And this is why I own currently the L Extreme as the only filter, uh, narrowband, multi-band filter that I have. Um, I may be wrong, my choices may be completely not good, but from my knowledge, it just makes sense. And you know, I wish that someone, whether it's Radian or uh, Optolong, or ZW or IDAS made a filter that was the L extreme, but with like three nanometer or four nanometer band passes. That would be amazing. So yeah, that's uh, that's my overview of the filters. My summary for someone who's in Tokyo like me, uh, my preference goes to the L extreme filter, but because it's only seven nanometer band passes, very tight for very fast imaging systems like RASA, I would need, I, I get the feeling that we'd get very similar and maybe even better performance with the IDAS uh, NBZ 12 nanometer uh, band pass. It remains to be seen. I do not know for sure I would need to test those. I don't have the IDAS and I don't have a RASA 8. If someone wants to send that to me, feel free. But uh, yeah, so recommendation in the end, long story short, by the L Extreme, or if you have a fast system, by the IDAS NBZ. And if you know of any other filters that, uh, that I have overlooked, please let me know in the comments. Also clarification, I am not sponsored for this video at all whatsoever. So um, that's it. So with that, uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about. I think there will be a lot of debate down there in the, in the comments. I might be completely wrong and I absolutely recognize that. So please look down at the comments, look at any debate that's going on. There's probably a lot of good information down there and make your own decision. And uh, with those wise words, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you're new to the channel again and you like this kind of content, feel free to go down below, click that subscribe button, leave a comment, like the video. Uh, but more importantly, Always remember to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.